Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this webinar today, which is bringing you updates on children, adolescents, and HIV from the AIDS 2020 virtual conference, which was broadcast a few weeks ago. My name is Rika Kiergegaard. I am program specialist with the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And I'm very honored to open this webinar presented by the highly regarded HIV scientist, Dr. Lynn Mofenson. Dr. Mofenson is currently technical advisor to the research program at the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. She was at the National Institutes of Health from 1989 until her retirement in 2014, where she was responsible for program planning and the development and scientific direction of research studies and clinical trials in domestic and international pediatric, adolescent, and maternal HIV infection. UNICEF's Learning Collaborative has worked with Dr. Mofenson on several scientific webinars in the past, and so we are very pleased that she has agreed to host and curate this webinar with us again today, which brings you a summary of the latest science and the knowledge which was presented at the 23rd International AIDS Conference, held from the 6th to the 10th of July. We have 90 minutes for the webinar. The presentation will last just over an hour and it will be followed by Q&A. And before we get started, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, if you have any technical issue, please send us a message via the chat box. If you have any general comments, please also send them through the chat box, um, but do select all panelists and attendees as the default is panelists only. If you have a question, please send it at any time using the Q&A box located at the bottom of the Zoom window. And you can send your question through at any time during the presentation. However, we will only be taking the questions during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. As always, uh, the webinar is being recorded and the recording and the presentation PowerPoint will be made available online after the webinar on childrenandaids.org where you can find recordings of previous webinars and sign up for the Children and AIDS Learning Collaborative to receive emails about future webinars as well as other resources on children and HIV. Please note that in addition to this presentation slide deck, there will also be a longer version available, which is co covering more studies. We just do not have time to go through all of them today. That's it for the format. So without further ado, I will hand over to Lynn. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So we will talk about the IAS virtual conference and I'll also cover some material from the IAS International AIDS Conference COVID. So we're going to start with an update on the epidemiology of pediatric HIV from the July 2020 UN AIDS report. So this slide shows you new infections in children globally between 2000 and 2019. And you can see there's been a significant decline since 2000 from 480,000 to 150,000. But progress has stalled. Most of this decline in transmission occurred between 2004 to 2012. And you can see that since 2015, the slope of this decline has slowed and actually is almost flat between 2018 to 2019. And unfortunately, we've missed our targets for 2018 and 2020. And at the current rate of decline, it will take us more than 13 years to decrease our new infections in children to our 2020 target. So what are the primary missed opportunities? Well, 27% of new infections in children were linked to lack of maternal treatment during pregnancy or breastfeeding. And this is likely because the women were either not diagnosed or were diagnosed and not linked to treatment. And another 27% of new infections were a link to acute infection during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And 24% were linked to mothers losing access to HIV care or lack of retention and care. So resolving these three program gaps would actually reduce MTCT by 78%. 
As a result of these missed opportunities, few countries have achieved overall transmission rates of less than 5%. 13 of the 21 focus countries in Africa continue to have transmission rates of 10% or higher, and about half of this transmission occurs during breastfeeding, which you can see in orange. And even in countries that have good treatment coverage for pregnant women, gaps in retention adherence and HIV prevention result in MTCT rates greater than 5%. And you can see only four countries have overall rates less than 5%. So the number of children on treatment has increased, but our treatment targets have been missed. In 2019, it's estimated we have 1.8 million children, 0 to 14 years, living with HIV. And this shows you the number of children accessing treatment globally through 2019, as well as our 2018 and 2020 targets. So there are 960,000 children estimated to be on treatment, and you can see a clear plateauing in numbers of children on treatment since 2017. And we haven't even met our lower 2020 target. And this shows you the percentage of HIV positive children receiving treatment. And in 2019, treatment coverage in children was 53% compared to 68% for adults. So Martina Penzato gave a really wonderful uh, plenary talk at the meeting, best ever plenary, I think. And she asked, why is it okay that just today, 400 children newly acquired HIV and 260 children died of AIDS-related conditions? Is this something that's acceptable? And she talked about three things. We need to act now, we need to do more operational research, and we need to keep innovating. So acting now included testing the children of individuals living with HIV, which is an inexpensive high yield intervention. And in a study I'll talk about a little bit later, looking at index testing, 12% uh, of index testing accounted for 28% of positive test results. So why is this not already being done more? Point of care early infant diagnosis has been proven to result in more rapid diagnosis and treatment start. Why is this not implemented now? Dioterkavir is now available for children as young as age four weeks, and now is the time to implement it. 30% of children and youth with HIV still present with severe immune suppression. And WHO had a package of care brochure that was um, made available in July to address advanced disease, screen, treat, optimize, and prevent. And then finally, she brought up a fourth 90, health and well-being with HIV, and that we need to, to pay attention to quality of life for children that we hope will live a long life. So we need a fourth 90. She talked about the need for operational research, that how you deliver is uh, as important as what you deliver, and that we should learn from what you're doing, and that lessons we learn from the response to COVID-19 can improve care for children and youth in the future, for example, and again, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, with COVID-19, we've increased the number of countries uh, all offering three months or more multi-month dispensing of treatment for children and adolescents more than doubled. We need to identify uh, and test solutions in multiple settings, learn what works, take it to scale, adopt to local context. And critical needs here are collaboration, capacity building, political support, and resources. And then finally, she talked about the need for innovation and also said again that COVID-19 has taught us that we actually can do things differently. We can use new adaptive trial designs to rapidly identify new treatments. We can provide access to children and pregnant women rapidly, such as uh, was done with Redesivir. We can rapidly develop trials in children and pregnant women. Uh, both the uh, trials in pregnant women and children for remdesivir are underway. And multi-group company collaborations can work. 
We need to promote new technologies for children. Uh, a number of different technologies are available for treatment that could be tested. And then finally, we need to speed new drug development for children. Uh, and she brought up the GAP-F partnership. So now I'm going to talk about a number of abstracts and we'll start by talking about dolutegravir and TAF. So the ADVANCE and NAMSAL adult uh, treatment trials for first-line treatment in Africa were presented uh, with long-term follow-up. Uh, they both showed more rapid viral suppression with dolutegravir, but similar long-term efficacy to efavirenz. So the first trial here is the ADVANCE trial, 59% female individuals were randomized to dolutegravir TAF, dolutegravir TDF, or efavirenz TDF. And you can see in the purple line there that both dolutegravir arms had very rapid viral suppression, but in the end, the rates of viral suppression out at week 96 were pretty similar, 79, 78, 74%. However, there were fewer serious adverse events and fewer grade three or four adverse events with dolutegravir than efavirenz. And with efavirenz failure, there was more emergent resistance. And similar data were shown in the NAMSEL trial here. We randomized people to dolutegravir TDF versus lower dose efavirenz 400. And that should be TDF, not TAF, sorry. Um, uh, adverse events were similar. Again, emergent resistance only with efavirenz failure. And you can see the rapid um, uh, increase in suppression with dolutegravir, but in the end, they were pretty similar. Both randomized trials showed excess weight gain with dolutegravir, particularly with TAF. And on the top, you see here, um, through week 144 weight gain in women and men. And you can see first that there's no real plateau in the weight gain over time. And that the weight increase with, was greater with any dolutegravir, either the TAF dolutegravir or the TDF uh, dolutegravir, but it was greatest with TAF in red compared to efavirenz, and this was especially true in women. They also looked at treatment emergent metabolic syndrome through week 96. And again here, TAF in red um, was significantly more metabolic syndrome than efavirenz in green, and this was most prevalent in women. And this is the same graph from the NAMSEL trial going out to week 96, and you see similar data here. The weight grain is, is, uh, is greater with dolutegravir TDF in orange than efavirenz in purple, especially in women. So then the advanced trial took these data and tried to estimate what this might mean in terms of pre-pregnancy weight gain and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So they used the advanced treatment-related emergent obesity rates and data on the relationship of obesity with adverse pregnancy outcome to, elevate, to estimate the relative risk for adverse pregnancy outcome by treatment regimen. And the graph shows you ART emergent obesity rates in red, you see TAF dolutegravir, 14%. Green is dolutegravir TDF, 8%. And then efavirenz in blue, 2%. So they then looked at the relative risk of adverse pregnancy outcome in obese versus normal BMI uh, individuals. And the table shows you um, the kind of increase in adverse pregnancy outcomes you see with these individual um, conditions such as a fourfold increase in adverse pregnancy outcome with gestational diabetes. And then they uh, predicted the potential increased adverse pregnancy outcomes that might occur due to art induced obesity. And they estimated that TAF dolutegravir might result in a 10% increase, TDF dolutegravir a 5% increase compared to a less than 1% increase with efavirenz. And these data, of course, need to be um, uh, verified in real life as opposed to modeling. So what about use of dolutegravir in younger individuals? And these are data from Baylor and Swatini, where they looked at 605 adolescents who were suppressed to less than 200, and then transitioned to dolutegravir, and they looked at weight and height before and after transition. The majority were on nevirapine-based art uh, prior to transmission to transition. 
So you can see in the graph after transition to dolutegravir, there was a significant increase in the BMI annual increase in uh, BMI that was above the normal expected for BMI increase in use. So the normal expected rate for boys is 0.64, for girls 0.55, and you can see after the switch it was 0.94. And there was a significant increase in BMI Z-score after dolutegravir uh, initiation. And after adjusting for multiple cofactors, they estimated the odds of becoming overweight or obese increased by 1% per day following the transition. And this was driven by the largest increase in youth who were initially categorized as thin prior to dolutegravir. So let's talk a little bit about dolutegravir in pregnancy. Um, this uh, is data from the pediatric HIV cohort study in the United States, uh, prospective cohort over 1,200 pregnant women and newborns, 21 states, uh, sites in the U.S., and they looked at women receiving a number of different uh, regimens, and they looked at viral suppression and adverse pregnancy outcome. So this looks at the adjusted risk of viral suppression by delivery. And dolutegravir treatment is in blue. And you can see viral suppression rates were 97 to 98%. And this was comparable to darunavir in green, ripivirine in kind of brown, uh, elvitegravir in green, but it was better than adazanavir or raltegravir in the red boxes. And this looks at adverse pregnancy outcome, a combination of different adverse outcomes. And you can see that this was comparable between all of the regimens and ranged between 22 to 27%. This looks at a meta-analysis of five clinical trials in pregnant women and looks at viral suppression. So this is over 1,000 pregnant women from five trials, three enrolled in late pregnancy, the Dolphin 1 and 2, and the VESTA trial, while two, NAM cell in advance, had women who became pregnant on study drugs. So that's preconception. So viral suppression, uh, significantly higher viral suppression with dolutegravir in blue than efavirenz in green, odds ratio 3. Um, and the differences between the trials and the extent of suppression likely reflects the timing of treatment initiation. There was no significant difference between dolutegravir and efavirenz in overall uh, adverse infant outcomes. But note, despite faster suppression, all five were in the dolutegravir arm, and there was a borderline trend for increased stillbirths with dolutegravir. Higher rate of preterm delivery with efavirenz than dolutegravir. No difference in small for gestational age. No significant difference for adverse events in either the mothers or the infants. And they also looked at TAF versus TDF and found no significant difference in adverse events between the mothers and infants with these two drugs. And so while dolutegravir does have superior virologic efficacy, all five infant infections were in dolutegravir, all in the women who started treatment during pregnancy. So this may be in utero transmission that occurred before they started treatment. Safety profiles of dolutegravir and efavirenz, as well as TAF and TDF appear similar, uh, but this is looking at short-term effects and long-term safety requires further assessment. This uh, study looked at women starting or transitioning to dolutegravir in Kenya. So a retrospective study over 5,000 women who started on dolutegravir uh, art at Ampath clinics in Kenya. 89% of the women were transitioning from efavirenz or nevirapine to dolutegravir. 61% were using any contraception at the time that they started dolutegravir, but it was primarily use of condoms. So 12 months post-starting dolutegravir, 87% remained on dolutegravir through 12 months, but 12% had changed back from dolutegravir to efavirenz or nevirapine. Viral suppression was high, and it was similar between those who stayed on dolutegravir in blue or those who switched back to efavirenz in kind of melon color there. 
They did telephone interviews with um, over 1,200 women who um, on their records had initiated dolutegravir in AMPATH clinics. And the surveys included questions about knowledge of taking dolutegravir and counseling that they had received from healthcare workers. So if you look at the red, only 33% of over 1,000 women who had said they ever used dolutegravir recalled receiving any counseling about potential teratogenic risk. And only 13% in blue of 289 who said they used efavirenz reported receiving counseling about potential efavirenz interactions with contraceptive implants. And 21% of women who self-reported ever using dietegravir also reported switching off of dietegravir. So what are the new data on neural tube birth defects and preconception dietegravir? So these are the Tasambo data. Just to remind you, they started out with eight sites covering all 45% of all births in Botswana, expanded to 18 sites, and since uh, September 2019, uh, have continued at 16 sites, which cover 70% of all births in the country. And here we see the initial results in May, 426 uh, dietegravir preconception exposures for neural tube defects with a prevalence of 0.94. And you can see this is significantly different than the other um, comparisons, non dietegravir preconception, efavirenz preconception, or HIV uninfected. So in March 2019, they had increased their numbers fourfold. There were five defects, which brought the prevalence rate down to 0.3, with really very little change in the other comparison groups. So this slide shows you the evolution over time for these four groups. And currently in April 2020, we now have over 3,500 exposures, seven neural tube defects with a prevalence of 0.19. And you'll note that this has really kind of stabilized since September 2019 and not really changed. The other uh, uh, NTD rates have remained basically straight lines. So the prevalence difference between dolutegravir and non-dolutegravir preconception is now uh, not statistically significant, just by a, a, a little bit, minus 0.03. But the prevalence difference between dolutegravir and efavirenz and uninfected remains um, still significant. So it looks like after a period of decline since the original safety signal, the prevalence of NTD among infants born to women on dolutegravir at conception appears to be stabilizing at a low prevalence level. Um, and we'll see with the next review, which is in about uh, six months, whether this continues to go down or remain stable. Uh, this is not presented at the uh, IAS, but I thought would be of interest to people. These are the newest data from the Antiretroviral Pregnancy Registry through January. There are now over 1,000 exposures, preconception to any integrase inhibitor, 382 to dolutegravir, and there's one neural tube defect in the prospective APR for a rate of 0.26%. Uh, these are data presented from the CDC from the US. And what they did was they analyzed um, commercial data and Medicaid databases, including clinical diagnoses, procedures, medications, to look at maternal exposure to drugs, neural tube defects, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. And they compared um, the results of NTD and adverse pregnancy outcome between HIV negative and HIV positive women by type of treatment. So there were 7,168 HIV positive pregnancies, 235 were on dolutegravir in the red box. And you can see there were no neural tube defects among 1,234 HIV positive women on any integrase inhibitor, including dolutegravir. NTD prevalence among 6.4 million HIV uninfected women was as to be expected. Um, 0.05 to 0.06 percent. 
and the prevalence of stillbirth, spontaneous and induced abortions in the blue boxes was higher in HIV positive women, particularly those on no treatment compared to uninfected women, but was not associated with specific antiretroviral drug use. And just a note that timing of initiation of drugs was not available. So moving on to talk a little bit about pediatric antiretroviral therapy. Uh, these are data from Kenya, looking at over 700 children on treatment, um, randomized to either standard of care or intervention. And the intervention was point of care viral load every three months with targeted drug resistance monitoring if viral load was over 1,000. And they presented preliminary results on resistance testing in the intervention arm. 365 randomized, 60 had a viral load greater than 1,000 and had at least one resistance test. 51 of the 60 or 85% had drug resistance mutations to NRTIs, NNRTIs, or both. As one might expect, this is primarily K103N and M184V. And they concluded that children with viral failure are likely to have drug resistance and therefore uh, prolonged efforts to increase adherence is likely not going to result in uh, viral suppression and suggested that early drug resistance testing with viral failure to determine appropriate treatment regimen uh, change might be more desirable than uh, just doing adherence counseling over and over again. Uh, these are data from the New Horizons project. These are HIV positive children enrolled in the New Horizons study who are receiving darunavir, ritonavir, or travarine through a drug donation program. Uh, so this is an observational cohort of 169 children on third line treatment in five different countries. Median age was 12 years. Most uh, prior treatment was second line PI based treatment. Um, and you can see 81% of the kids had changed for confirmed resistance and 98% had one or more resistance mutations with 71% having three TAMs or more and 52% PI mutations. Viral response, however, was pretty reasonable. Uh, viral response to third line of those who have had testing so far. Uh, viral suppression to less than 1,000 was 75% at six months and 78% at 12 months on this third line treatment. Uh, less than 50 was somewhat less, 46% and 51%. Uh, this study looked at factors associated with viral suppression using pre-enrollment viral load data on over 700 in children uh, and their caregivers recruited into a randomized trial. So this is baseline data. Biologic mothers were the most common caregivers. 80% of the caregivers were HIV positive and 45% reported viral suppression. 78% of the kids had viral suppression. And they found that children in care of the biologic mother compared to other caregivers were more likely to have suppression. And interestingly, children who had virologically suppressed caregivers were over seven times more likely to have suppression themselves. This looked at factors associated with non-adherence to treatment in adolescents in Uganda. These are school-going adolescents who um, had uh, unsuppressed viral load and adherence less than 95%. 39% of the 325 youth were non-suppressed and um, of these 87% reported adherence of less than 95%. So remember these are school growing uh, going children and the reasons given for poor adherence, the majority of the reasons were actually school-related issues. They joined a boarding school, they went to a new school, they joined a higher uh, elevation class, and they concluded that there was a need for HIV school-related interventions targeting both teachers and students to create a flexible and conducive environment for HIV-positive students. 
this study uh, is again from Uganda, 900 youth participating in an intervention trial, and they did a cross-sectional analysis of baseline data, including a variety of different life events shown in the box to identify any associations with viral suppression. 17% of youth had two or more overlapping uh, life events, um, and 4% had three or more overlapping life events. So then they looked at a multivariate analysis of predictors of viral suppression. So having two or more recent life events using alcohol were both less likely to be suppressed, whereas older age disclosure of HIV status to family members or to a partner were more likely to uh, be suppressed. And they pointed out that you can use these factors to identify those who are most vulnerable and need attention to help with suppression. Moving on to HIV testing and case finding. Uh, these are data from Pakistan. I think everyone's pretty familiar with the outbreak there. In uh, April to December 2019, over 1,000 children tested positive for HIV. And they conducted a household-based, individually matched case control study where they tested the children for HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, and tested the mother for HIV. And they had 101 cases and 101 controls matched to the case by age, sex, and home location. And you can see none of the mothers were HIV positive in the controls, and only 7% were positive in the cases. And they found risk factors for HIV to be visits to the government hospital, visits to private clinics, number of injections, and blood transfusions. Additionally, children who were HIV positive were more likely to be hepatitis B and hepatitis C positive. So they concluded this outbreak is primarily spread through the parenteral route linked to unsafe injection and blood transfusion practices and the need for the country to invest in improving blood service and injection practices. Uh, this study was a cluster, uh, cluster randomized trial of over 2,000 people looking at uh, randomization to HIV self-testing in high-risk HIV uninfected women versus uh, a control. So the, the self-testing intervention, they got five self-tests at enrollment, additional tests on a three-month basely. Uh, basis and they were encouraged to offer the test to their partners. The control group got referral cards. So these high-risk women were able to distribute self-tests to sex partners. About 50% of the tests were given to their partners. 50% used themselves. Provision of these tests led to a significant 35% increase in primary partner and 45% increase in couple testing and identified 1.8 times more HIV positive sexual partners per patient than did the uh, referral card. There was increased condom use at six months, but not 12 and 24 months, and there was no increase in intimate partner violence. However, there was no effect on HIV incidence. As you can see here, the unadjusted hazard ratio was 1.1 uh, 1 and overlaps uh, 1. So they concluded additional prevention interventions are needed. This looks at PEPFAR program uh, country testing data in children from 12 African countries to determine the proportion of children identified through index testing. So eight of 12 countries had a significant increase in index testing of children. And the percent of tests that were done through index testing ranged from four to 29%. And the percent of children identified by index testing increased, ranged from nine to 68%, with eight countries identifying more than one in four and three countries identifying more than 50% of HIV positive children through index testing. And this looks at the yield of testing by age, with the darkest blue being age 1 to 4, the gray 5 to 9, and the light blue 10 to 14. And you can see at all age groups, there was a reasonable yield with the highest yield in the youngest children, 4.5%, 2.5%, 3.5%, 
2.8 and 2.7 percent in children over five. So there was a significant increase in index testing and a significant proportion of HIV positive children were identified through index testing, including not just young children, but also young older children who had never been diagnosed. This was a community-based parenting program that looked at the effect of the program on HIV testing uh, in children. So this intervention took caregivers and uh, children who were aged one to five, and they had group sessions delivered by community health workers, eight uh, weekly sessions, and they also had community health days, but more important, they had HIV specific education, they had a storybook, a song, and a film, all that were developed with the community. 12-month follow-up was 98% in both intervention and control arms, and the endpoint focused here was HIV testing rates. So while most mothers' HIV status was known, 98% of mothers knew their status, only about half of children's status was known at baseline. And encouragingly, there was a significant increase in children receiving HIV testing with the intervention group at three and continued at 12 months after the intervention stopped in follow-up. Uh, this study looked at determinants of HIV testing for youth in Uganda, was a mixed methods study with questionnaires and in-depth interviews. The prevalence of ever being tested was high, 81% higher in females than males. And on adjusted analysis, the factors associated with testing in youth were female sex, older age, marriage, history of having sex, peer encouragement, and positive perception of youth-friendly services. And the interviews re revealed five emergent issues related to HIV testing. Number one, that decisions on testing were related to self-evaluation of risk. Secondly, that fears of a positive test was deferring some people from testing. Third, that engagement in other health services facilitated testing for HIV. Barriers included fear of injections, less insufficient confidentiality, non-youth friendly services, and there were actually mixed feelings on mobile testing with a lack of privacy being listed as a concern. Uh, this study looks at negative PCR results among very early treated children in South Africa. And this was part of the leopard study in South Africa, which enrolls neonates with confirmed in utero infection and starts treatment in the first two weeks of life. 46 children attained viral load less than 50, and 14 of these 46 or 30% had a negative diagnostic DNA PCR after starting treatment. And in 71% last PCR remained negative. Um, factors associated with a negative PCR included higher CD4% uh, pretreatment and higher cycle, cycle thresholds on birth PCR. So that means actually a lower viral load. And they noted that clinicians need to be alert to the possibility of a false negative PCR test in infants who started on early treatment to avoid confusion about that infant's HIV status. They are infected, they just have a negative PCR because they started treatment early. Uh, so one comment, uh, one study on multi-month art dispensing. Um, this was a cluster randomized trial of six-month uh, multi-month dispensing in South Africa that enrolled individuals uh, that were enrolled already in adherence clubs. Uh, and the difference between the two were that the frequency of dispensing was every six months with the intervention versus every two to four months in the standard of care. They found retention was high in both arms, whether it was six or two or four months, but importantly that getting a viral load test and the rate of viral suppression was very high and similar in both groups, showing non-inferiority of six month dispensing. A few studies on PMTCT cascades. This is a study from South Africa that looked at transmission at 12 months. Um, in uh, about 2,500 HIV-positive mothers attending ANC. 
and they used electronic medical records. So 88% of the women already knew their HIV status and most of these were already on treatment. And most of the women who were diagnosed antepartum started on treatment and became suppressed. 94% of infants had an EID test by 10 weeks, but of note that 80% were tested at birth and if they were negative, there was a decrease in return for testing at 10 weeks. The overall 12 month transmission rate was only 1.6%, which is great, except 10% of infants lacked a 12 month outcome. And risk factors for infant infection are, as one might assume, starting treatment preconception gave you lower transmission, being first diagnosed with HIV at delivery or postpartum gave you higher transmission, and no suppression or no viral load test was associated with infection. This study uh, came from the Cabejo study in Rwanda and looked at factors associated with interruption of HIV care. So in this study, most women who interrupted care eventually did return, and what they did was evaluate factors associated with a missed visit in women who later returned to care. So individual factors like age, education, marital status, disclosure, travel, they were not significantly associated with the missed visit, but importantly, health facility factors had strong association with reduced care and treatment interruptions, including the number of days that ANC was available, the availability of retention support, peer counseling, and infant feeding counseling. And the investigators suggested that these health system factors may be effective targets for interventions to improve retention. A little bit on TB and HIV. Um, this looked at risk factors for hepatic toxicity in pregnant and postpartum women receiving INH prophylaxis from the APRAISE trial. In this study, IPT was either started immediately after the first trimester of pregnancy or deferred until 12 weeks postpartum in women who were on treatment, primarily an NRTI-based treatment, and LFTs were monitored. So 6% had one or more hepatic toxicity events, and it was similar whether you started antepartum or postpartum. But interestingly, the uh, ALT increase was primarily postpartum and peaked at 12 weeks postpartum in both arms, 84% occurring after one week postpartum, whether you started at antepartum or postpartum. Um, Factors associated with hepatic toxicity, there was an interaction between INH and an antiretroviral regimen. So if you were on a Favrins, you were more likely to have postpartum toxicity, whereas if you were on nevirapine, you were more likely to have antepartum toxicity. Also starting cotrimoxazole after week 12 postpartum and CYP2B6 genotype. So they noted that it's critical to monitor for hepatic toxicity postpartum, which is when most events occur, and that you need to consider the treatment regimen and cotrimoxazole use in terms of looking at that. This study looked at the pediatric TB clinical cascade in 16 African countries. So this looks at median cascade indices so if we look at the first uh, graph here, screening in purple was high overall, ranging from 86 to uh, 92%. But screening positivity in green was lower than expected, particularly given children living with HIV. And the TB actual diagnosis was unclear because the data were not age disaggregated. So TB treatment initiation in those children who had a positive screen in green, treatment initiation in brown was really low, regardless of region, number of children living with AIDS or TB incidence. Uh, the highest was 28%. Looking at TB prophylaxis, TB prophylaxis initiation in the kind of uh, redder brown was very low, regardless of region. And completion was highest in Eastern, but low in Southern and Western Africa, and that is in the green. 
So they notice that children and adolescents need to be considered when one is looking at national and subnational data, including monitor and evaluation, getting age appropriate formulations, healthcare worker training, adherence counseling, and strategic planning for prophylaxis. Uh, this was an interesting little study that looked at biomarkers of infant adherence to INH prophylaxis. They developed a urine INH dipstick that you could put in the urine and color changes with an INH metabolite so that you could determine whether or not the child got INH within 30 hours. And they compared the urine test to standardized adherence questionnaire. So you can see below in the graph, caregiver reported measure of adherence, optimal, less than 24 hours, et cetera. And the dark brown shows you those who had a color change and therefore were taking the INH. And you can see only 50% of infants with a caregiver reported adherence had a positive urine INH test. So this suggests that there's an over-reporting of infant INH adherence. Um, maternal education and viral suppression were associated with adherence, kind of uh, similar to the caregiver viral suppression and child viral suppression. Uh, and, and potentially biomarker monitoring may be useful to evaluate and motivate medication adherence. Uh, a bunch of uh, presentations were on adolescents. Uh, this graph shows you uh, HIV incidence with the darkest red being the highest incidence. And you can see uh, new HIV infection rates vary across and between regions um, and generally is highest in Southern Africa, but subnational data show districts across the region with very high rates of HIV infection and point towards the critical need to improve prevention interventions for this group. So these are data from a survey in Uganda in in and out of school adolescents looking at HIV, syphilis, and sexual risk behaviors. The weighted HIV prevalence was 1% and syphilis prevalence was 1.2%. And youth who were out of school and who were older were more likely to have a higher prevalence. This looks at sexual risk-taking behavior uh, in school or out of school. So for those who were out of school, they were more likely to ever have sex, have first sex before 15, or ever have an STI. Whereas those who were in school um, were more likely to use prevention of pregnancy and more likely to use a condom at last sex. And they concluded that these findings suggest it's important to keep girls in school and to develop specific prevention interventions to target out of school girls. Uh, this looked at a, an evaluation of the DREAMS project in Zimbabwe. This was an, a non-randomized design. They compared two intervention and then four comparison sites without DREAMS and did 24 month follow-up. Um, the baseline HIV prevalence was higher in the non-DREAM sites, and they did yearly HIV testing in those who were HIV negative. Follow-up was a little bit over 50% in both groups at 24 months, uh, and they adjusted for differences in metrics on analysis. So while HIV incidence was lower in the DREAM site, on adjustment, this was no longer statistically significant. As you can see, the p-value was 0.287. They found that uh, these young sex workers use clinical services more over time, but few actually access the non-clinical dream services that were provided. Um, most of the sex workers in the dream sites were offered PrEP. A third reported initiation, but retention was suboptimal, and HIV incidence was similar to those who never started PrEP. So clearly, we need some better approaches. This looks at the impact of DREAMS uh, on HSV2 acquisition in uh, South Africa. So they enrolled a cohort of over 2,000 adolescent girls. 78% uh, completed a two-year follow-up, and they looked at HSV2. 
So at baseline 2017 in blue and end line 2019 in gray, you can see there was very high HSV2 prevalence. There was a high HIV, HSV2 incidence overall. And when they looked at DREAMS versus non-DREAMS beneficiaries, there was really not a significant difference. The graph on the right shows you the adjusted relative risk. And you can see for all adolescent girls or divided up by age, this overlaps one. So not so good. This study found no effective cash transfer when you added to a combination prevention intervention. So as part of the DREAMS project in Tanzania, this project instituted a core package of services that are listed below, biomedical, behavioral, and structural. And they did a cluster randomized trial looking at out of school youth, randomized to unconditional cash transfer or no unconditional tra cash transfer in combination with these DREAMS interventions with the primary endpoint being HSV2 zero conversion. There were no differences in sexual behavior between the arms and no overall effect of cash transfer on HSV2 conversion. Although when they stratified it by the communities being at high or low risk and rural or urban, they did say that uh, it looked like it might be more effective in rural communities with low HIV risk where actually it may not be needed as much. This looks at the effect of economic support and community dialogue on adolescent risk behaviors in Zambia. So it was a cluster randomized trial that looked at economic support, unconditional cash transfers to the girls and to parents, and combined support, taking the economic support plus community meetings with parents and youth clubs and followed up for um, four years. Uh, median age, mean age was about 14 years. Very few had had a boyfriend, very few had used contraceptives. Um, there was no significant effect on contraceptive use, but they did find a significant effect of economic support and community intervention on decreasing self-reported sexual behavior. And there didn't appear to be a difference between the combined and economic, so not clear that the combined actually added that much. And then finally, this is the sister to sister program in Zimbabwe that actually looked very effective. This was a structured peer group behavioral intervention that's led by female mentors and organized by age. And they have programs in 23 districts in Zimbabwe led by 130 uh, mentors. And you can see the program uh, on the right. They analyzed program data for almost 100,000 girls who were enrolled to evaluate uh, exposure to the program and then a variety of uh, outcomes. They had pretty good um, uh, attendance to the, rec to, the, uh, to, the, to the intervention. And they then did a follow-up with over 4,000 graduates. And they found that it was an effective behavioral intervention. Those who attended 75% or more sessions had an increased odds of HIV testing and a decreased odds of school dropout and child marriage. Those who had more than 85% attendance were also more likely to return to school. And those who attended them all were also more likely to use family planning and to actually report sexual abuse when it happened. And when they augmented the group exercises with individual sessions, this increased the likelihood of program completion. Um, and outcomes were sustainable up to one year's post-event intervention. So moving on to PrEP in adolescence. Um, this is from the ECHO trial, a randomized trial looking at DMPA, copper IUD, or um, implant. What they did was they looked at South Africa sites that implemented on-site provision of PrEP in the last year of the study. And their objective was to uh, evaluate the impact of PrEP access on HIV incidents in South Africa sites by when the access began, comparing overall incidents before and after PrEP access. 
And they did this in two ways. They included only study visits after on-site prep access, or they included study visits within six months before on-site access because prep was available in the country before they had on-site access. And they found that um, approximately 25% of women started PrEP. So this is now looking at overall HIV incidence, regardless of whether they started PrEP or not. And you can see after on-site PrEP access was implemented, overall HIV incidence decreased by 50%, suggestive that um, having on-site PrEP access was important in reducing incidence. Uh, this study looked at uptake of PrEP in adolescent girls in PEPFAR-supported uh, countries, implementation in 15 countries uh, of over almost 170,000 PrEP initiations. 51% were in adolescent girls in the purple line with a twofold increase between 2018 and 2019. The uptake in adolescent girls was similar to that in key populations in blue. Um, women 20 to 24, the yellow line, represented a higher proportion of those starting PrEP than uh, girls 15 to 19 in green. Most of this occurred in DREAMS countries, and they noted that despite COVID, they had still started over 40,000 adolescents and girls in PrEP in 50, uh, fiscal year 2020. This was an intervention to increase PrEP use in adolescent girls at risk of IPV. It was nested in DREAMS, had three components, PrEP support club, community sensitization for men, and couples PrEP education caused a bubble, uh, buddies day. It was a pilot randomized trial to either the DREAMS activities only or DREAMS activities plus these three components. Um, it was a pilot study. They had good retention. 100% uh, attended at least one support club. 90% attended a buddy day, most with partners, but only 31% attended community sensitization. They found that uh, intimate partner violence was non-significantly lower in the intervention group. PrEP uptake was higher in the intervention group, but as most studies in youth show, PrEP adherence was relatively poor. Uh, they concluded this was a safe, feasible intervention and planned to do a uh, larger clinical trial to uh, have more power to be able to assess the effect. I think this is the final one on PrEP, um, oral PrEP and family planning integration. So this is a project that um, provided PrEP to adolescent girls through a variety of different facilities and included uh, demand creation in the community by peer educators and joint uh, provision of PrEP and family planning. So factors associated with PrEP discontinuation, those uh, at, at one month, those who attended had a peer network, those who attended private facilities or drop-in facilities were less likely to discontinue, and those who did not have family planning offered were more likely to discontinue, and similar things found at three months. So adolescents who concurrently started PrEP and family planning were more likely to continue than those who started uh, PrEP alone. And those entering through a peer network or drop-in or private facility were also more likely to continue. Ah, one more. This is uh, the PrEP PP in uh, Cape Town. This is a cohort of HIV infected, uh, uninfected uh, pregnant and postpartum women who were recruited during ANC. 92% um, of the women opted to start PrEP. Retention was 71% at one month, 59% at three months. And of those who returned, PrEP adherence was very good, nearly 90% at one month, 85% at three months. And they reported that um, PrEP retention and persistence was associated with age over 25, uh, having STI baseline, more than one sex partner, having HIV status unknown partner, um, alcohol use reported in more frequent sex acts. So I wanted to end the IIS portion talking about new PrEP options, which I think are pretty exciting. The HPTN 083 results were reported and results of 084 in women are anticipated in 2021. So this is PrEP with long-acting injectable carbitegravir. 
So this uh, randomized MSM or transgender women at risk of HIV, uh, they started with a five week oral uh, regimen to be able to uh, get levels up. And then they began either IM carbotegravir plus oral placebo or IM placebo plus oral tenofovir, uh, FTC for three years. Uh, they covered the tail of carbotegravir with uh, daily TDF FTC. There were 52 infections. There were 13 in the carbotegravir arm 39 in the tenofovir arm, pooled HIV incidence was 0.81, and you can see the cumulative incidence by study arm in the figure with a hazard ratio of 0.34, highly significant, 66% better efficacy for prevention when compared to TDF FTC prep. Of the 13 incidents, carbotegravir infections, two were infected prior to drug administration, five were infected after a prolonged stop of carbotegravir, three occurred during the oral lead-in phase, and only five occurred during cab injections. Of the 39 incident uh, tenofovir infections, three were prior to drug administration, three had intermittent uh, visit adherence, and the rest occurred during um, tenofovir administration, and they still have to examine levels in those who became infected. 81% of carbotegravir had injection reactions, but most of these were mild in green or moderate in yellow. Um, only 2.2% permanently discontinued due to injection uh, reactions. As one might expect, creatinine clearance decrease was more frequent with tenofovir than carbotegravir. Hyperglycemia was more frequent with carbotegravir. Uh, and weight gain was higher with carbotegravir. They didn't show a graph of that. Um, they said most of this difference occurred during the first year. So the key takeaways here um, are new findings on weight gain. NTD safety signal appears to stabilize at a low level. Critical need to evaluate third line treatment in children given the high prevalence of resistance in those with failures. A number of testing innovations may improve identification of children and adults. TB cascading children remains problematic. Need to be able to look at new interventions to prevent incident infections in girls, new interventions to improve PrEP uptake and adherence, with this new long-acting PrEP option being very relevant for adolescent girls and young women, uh, and hopefully we'll have results next year. So just want to move to talk about some of the COVID-19 abstracts. Um, first, to talk about effects on mitigation practices. So this is looking at HIV self-testing during the COVID pandemic in Eswatini. And they had begun an oral self-testing pilot with a community-based intervention. There was the national lockdown due to COVID and all non-essential businesses were closed and community HIV self-testing had to be paused. However, the Ministry of Health recommended community distribution through pharmacies and shops as channels for distribution. And you have some pictures there. So what did they see? Primary, before the lockdown, HIV self-testing was primarily used for index contact tracing before lockdown. And after, you can see an increase in the number of self-tests distributed. Um, almost 50% of those who received a test were male. 17% of those reached had never been tested uh, for HIV in the past. And this was highest among males. Um, Follow-up calls after test distribution showed that 89% used the test kit, 3% were HIV positive, and uh, of the 45% new diagnoses, 59% had started on treatment as of May in one month. And they concluded that HIV self-testing is playing an important role in normalizing testing, decreasing stigma, and enabled reaching clients that they wouldn't normally through standard, test, uh, standard targeted testing. This is PEPFAR countries looking at multi-month dispensing in 37 countries before and after. So prior to COVID-19, one third of persons on treatment had adopted more than three month MMD. 
uh, but children were excluded more frequently than adults, as you can see. Uh, after uh, COVID, you can see there was a significant increase in countries allowing multi-month dispensing for pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and particularly children and adolescents. Um, 24 of 37 countries had modified their policies due to COVID-19 and the investigators recommending maintaining these expanded MMDs after COVID-19 for the benefit of patients and the health system. Uh, this is back from the partners of uh, the PrEP PP study in South Africa that we just talked about. And what they did was looked at retention and persistent on PrEP before and after lockdown. And as one might anticipate, there was a 33% decrease in retention and study refills after lockdown, a 2.4 fold odds in missing a study visit during the lockdown. And barriers cited were fear of COVID, fear of the police, limited transport, uh, long lines. Uh, and they noted that these barriers needed to be addressed, including community-based or home prep delivery, telephone uh, adherence monitoring, et cetera. And this study looked at declining trends in maternal and child health use, uh, service use in Guatemala. Um, with the Ministry of Health, they evaluated key maternal and child service use data before and after uh, the pandemic. This just shows you what they looked at. They found a 21% drop in women having one or more ANC visits, a 54% drop in women attending postpartum care, 7% drop in, in uh, children receiving their third DPT. Uh, so they are trying to identify strategies to maintain these services during the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, a few things on treatment. Uh, this looks at remdesivir compassionate use in pregnant and postpartum women. So there were 86 women, 67 were pregnant, 19 were postpartum. You'll note that more postpartum women needed invasive support than pregnant women, and also that 64% of the women had a comorbidity. 93% of pregnant women and 89% of postpartum women recovered with a higher rate of improvement with remdesivir in women not needing mechanical ventilation compared to those needing mechanical ventilation, but even so both groups did pretty well. Um, they had a lot of preterm deliveries, mostly due to the severity of COVID-19, but no new safety uh, uh, signals identified. And this looks at uh, compassionate use in children. So here we have 77 children, 51% of these required ventilation. And you'll note these are primarily older children, 53% were greater than 12 years, and a majority of the children had existing medical conditions. Clinical recovery in 80% of children on ventilators and ECMO and 87% who did not require invasive support and recovery was pretty much similar in all of the age groups. There were four deaths, um, primarily due to COVID-19, no new safety concerns identified. Uh, and finally, to end talking about mother to child transmission. So this study was a prospective study of women with converted confirmed COVID-19 admitted to Milan hospitals, and they looked at SARS-CoV-2 in blood, vaginal, and uh, feces. 56 were pregnant, uh, six were non-pregnant, and you can see here the type of specimen, plasma, vaginal, rectum, and newborn swab, and you can see viremia was rare uh, and only seen in severely ill women. 4% had viremia and only those who were really sick. There was no virus in vaginal secretion, but 25% uh, had it in rectal samples and no evidence of infant infection in this study. This is a, a different study from Italy that looked at 31 pregnant women in the third trimester and evaluated them in depth for mother to child transmission, including placental biopsies, umbilical cord biopsies, blood from mother and infant and vaginal swab. And in selected cases, they did placental biopsies. So of 31 infants born to mothers with COVID-19, there was possible in utero infection in two infants. One was a preterm infant, 34 weeks, 
vaginal delivery, born to a mother with very severe disease. The mother had viremia, had IgM and IgG antibody, had a positive vaginal and placental swab. The infant had virus and umbilical cord, but no IgM. Um, and uh, the infant had a positive nasopharyngeal PCR at delivery, but it was negative at one week, had no symptoms, no abnormal labs. The other possible case was in a mother with mild disease, term infant, vaginal delivery, negative maternal blood, a positive maternal IgG and M, negative studies on the vagina, the placenta, but the infant had IgM. Uh, this infant had a positive NP at delivery, but was negative at three days, also no symptoms, no abnormal labs. So SARS-CoV-2 viremia was found in another mother with severe disease, but all of the specimens, including the infant, were negative. Of the 31 women, one of 11 breast milk samples were positive, both for virus and for um, IgM antibody. This mother had severe disease, but no virus elsewhere. Uh, infant was negative uh, at birth, no symptoms, no abnormal labs. They did a study of the placentas of three selected women, including two from the prior swab. They said that there was an altered inflammatory gene expression, but this was strongest in the woman who had no viral detection in the placenta. Um, cytokine studies were done in three mother-infant pairs that found hyperactive inflammatory profile in both maternal and infant blood, but um, there could be transplacental maternal fetal cytokine transfer. Uh, and this, I think, is the final study looked at uh, IgA response in milk. Uh, so this looked at milk from 15 breastfeeding women who recovered from COVID-19. And they compared this to a repository of milk from 10 win women prior to the pandemic. Most of these women were infected postpartum, uh, and the majority were greater than one month postpartum. All of the milk samples from the COVID-19 recovered donor uh, con contain significant levels of SARS-CoV-2 specific IgA uh, as well as receptor binding domain IgA while all the controls which are these little dotted lines here were negative and it didn't necessarily correlate with uh, IgG. Unclear whether this would provide protection for breastfed infants and they clearly need a larger sample size to study but clearly antibody can be found in milk. So to try to summarize issues around potential mother-to-child transmission. So intrauterine infection, viremia is very rare in women, less than 3%, and virus is very rare in amniotic fluid. And this means that placental infection will be rare and might be more likely in mothers with severe COVID-19 where there's a higher prevalence of viremia and possible placental barrier disruption due to thrombosis. In these cases, the placental amniotic fluid or neonatal blood test would be positive. And the most important piece here is persistence of the positive test. Perinatal infection, vaginal secretions are rarely positive, but because there is a such high concentration of the virus in maternal feces, vaginal delivery has potential viral exposure. Um, and there's also potential exposure after birth. And I don't think you can distinguish between intrapartum and very early peripartum horizontal transmission. This appears possible, but seems uncommon. Um, uh, likely exposure to maternal fecal virus or virus in respiratory secretions as opposed to intrapartum transmission is the likely source. Most of the infants reported with positive NP swabs have no symptoms. And again, persistence is important here. One comment that you have a lot of infants who are reported to have a single positive nasopharyngeal swab or one positive amniotic fluid, but there's no persistence um, and there's no immune response. And this probably reflects superficial exposure or contamination as opposed to actual infection. And then finally, with breast milk infection, virus is rarely found in milk. When it's found, it appears transient. 
antibody may be present, and infection through viral presence in breast milk appears unlikely, and more likely horizontal transmission through respiratory secretion contact, although we clearly need more studies. So in summary, for COVID, while mitigation interventions have had unwanted negative consequences, there are lessons learned that might improve HIV programs in the future. It's encouraging that new treatments are being studied in pregnant women and children more rapidly than previously. Mother-to-child transmission may occur, but in utero infection is rare. Transmission in the peripartum period more likely. And as we said, breast milk contains antibody, but protective aspects are unclear. And I think that is it. Thank you so much for this comprehensive overview of both the scientific advances and the programmatic learnings of HIV, as well as COVID-19 and their intersections. Um, and especially what we can learn from the HIV response to COVID-19 and bring forward and retain in the future. So we now have just under 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and as mentioned, we will be taking all of the questions from the Q&A box. I see a few that have already come in, uh, whereas you can still send general comments through the chat box. To moderate the Q&A, we have my colleague Shafiq Isaji with us, who is Senior Advisor, HIV at UNICEF Headquarters. Uh, his connection is a little bit shaky, but we'll try. So over to you, Shafiq. Uh, thank you very much, Rike, and thank you very much, Lynn, for, as usual, an exceptional presentation. We have a couple of questions to kick off. Uh, from Chewe. Um, there was a question regarding the reported increases in weight gain related to dolutegravir. What should we be saying about the concerns around weight gain and obesity related to dolutegravir use in pregnancy? Over to you, Lynn. Yeah, so I think we need more data before we start panicking here. Um, not shown for this presentation because it was, I think, presented at CROI. There are data on weight gain in Vested and also from uh, Botswana that do show greater weight gain with dolutegravir than efavirenz, but that despite that greater weight gain, weight gain in HIV positive women is still less than seen in HIV negative women. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is really not weight gain during pregnancy. It might be weight gain prior to becoming pregnant. And I think we need further data to validate the assumptions that advance made in terms of adverse pregnancy outcome. So I don't view the weight gain as something that should um, prevent a woman from uh, taking dolutegravir. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that clarification. And obviously, with the increasing uptake of dolutegravir, that additional uh, 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 data should be shortcoming, uh, forthcoming shortly. Um, a question from Janet Saul, uh, thanking you again for the amazing summary. Uh, the sister to sister study, which was a behavioral intervention looking at ways of improving HIV interventions, uh, a, a, a HIV prevention outcomes through a combination of efforts. Uh, did that have a comparison group or was it simply looking at pre-effects and comparing them to post-effects following implementation of the sister-to-sister -sister intervention? Mm, I'd have to go back to the slide. Um, I don't know if that will be disruptive. My, my memory was that it, was that it didn't have a comparison group, but uh, if you want, <laughs> we, can, we can try to go back and find that study. Uh, maybe, maybe if we uh, have more time, I think it was slide, um, it was around about slide 70 or 60, 70 that uh, reflected that, I think, hmm. 60, maybe. yeah. Okay. Um, well, why don't you keep going? Doing, yeah. yeah. While you're doing that, Lynn, um, another question coming in from uh, our colleagues in the field. Um, uh, based on what you presented related to the risk of neural tube defects with dolutegravir, and you showed the very nice transition over time from real concern to much lower concern, um, Chungu from Zambia asks, 
what what is the final takeaway message if there is one related to ntd risk with dolutegravir now that we have a year and a half of perspective over mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think we can't say that this has gone away and is not a concern. I think what we can say is that uh, the increased risk, if it's there, is extremely low, like one in a thousand excess NTDs, um, and that that should be very reassuring. Um, so I, I think that it simply validates what WHO has already recommended that dolutegravir is the preferred first line and second line therapy for everyone including women of reproductive age and who are pregnant and I don't think that we have I, I think that it it is further reassuring data and would make the risk benefit equation even stronger for dolutegravir. It looks like Indeed. sister to sister did not have a, uh, it was not a randomized trial. Sure. So it was presumably looking at uh, uh, the outcomes that were reported prior to yes. the intervention and comparing them with post intervention outcomes. Yeah. That's um, what it thank like. you for that, Lynn. Um, so uh, related again to dolutegravir and weight gain. Um, you know, we have a lot of questions about this because it's one of the few consistent side effects that the drug seems to have, um, which is very different from many of the other drugs that we use, where there are many other side effects. But are there concerns about abnormal weight gain in children in any of the data that you've seen or reviewed for this? Mm -hmm. um, well, we have that one in adolescence from Iswatini. And I believe um, the folks from DC Children's have a report in PID ID journal about excessive weight gain that they have found with dolutegravir use, primarily in adolescents, not young children. Mm -hmm. um, th those mm -hmm. are the data that I know of. So I think, yes, there's a concern. We clearly need more data um, and longer term follow up uh, data. Mm. Uh, and of course, to reiterate, we would expect to see some weight gain, almost a, a recovery of uh, lost weight uh, in a population effect uh, amongst kids starting ART. Um, but this is a little over and above that expected weight gain, just to clarify that issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a question from Raul Kamaju. Uh, related to the MTCT evidence around COVID-19. I think your takeaway from the data that was presented at IAS was that um, uh, essentially the jury is still out. It is possible, but not absolutely confirmed that there is true uh, vertical transmission uh, transplacentally. Um, uh, and uh, he mentions a study from uh, France. It was a, a case series from France um, uh, uh, published in, in, in Nature um, uh, this year. I don't know if yeah, you I can think, see that. Yeah, yeah no, I, think, I think he's re re um, talking about the Vivanti uh, report. And this, uh -huh. uh, I don't have a slide on it, but to me, this is the most convincing uh, report that uh, in utero transmission has occurred. This was a mother who was uh, severely sick. She was uh, on a ventilator. She had virus positive in her blood, virus positive in amniotic fluid, virus positive in the placenta, virus positive uh, in the infant blood, uh, NP swab positive, and the infant had symptoms. The infant had uh, not just uh, respiratory symptoms, but developed uh, uh, CNS symptoms with an abnormal MRI. Um, mm -hmm. So there was early exposure documented, there was persistence documented, and there were symptoms documented. Reassuringly, mm -hmm. at least in the paper, it said the child recovered by 13 days. Um, but that's the only case that I've, I've found so far that really met all the criteria for in utero infection. Wonderful. Uh, sounds like a pretty unusual and exceptional case with, with a very sick mom and, and high, high levels of viremia 
Um, but uh, we, we, we look for more evidence that that is a consistent problem. I think it would be fair to say that if it does occur, it's going to be a rare event since um, th th there, is relatively, there are relatively few really convincing cases where, where, where that can be documented. Um, mm -hmm. Another question from Chalilwe Chungu from Zambia, uh, and this is again related to the Dolutegraver issue amongst uh, 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 women. Given the significant reduction in risk and the fact that it's not completely gone away, um, how would you approach the issue of counseling, expectant, or uh, 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 women who are not yet pregnant but but potentially desiring to get pregnant or, or at risk of becoming pregnant, how would you counsel them um, in that regard around the use of dolutegravir? And, and I noted, by the way, from the slides that you presented, that often women felt that they were not properly aware of these risks, even before we had this new data that suggests that the risk is um, not as significant as we had originally thought. But what sorts of counseling should we be providing in this setting? So I, I think that when one is giving someone a drug, you should be talking to them both about the good things about the drug and the potential bad things about the drug. So all drugs have side effects. So as part of your counseling regarding the potential side effects that one might see, with the drug that you're being prescribed, I think we can say that there is a uh, study that shows a very small potential increased risk of neural tube defects that would be maybe one in a thousand that uh, a number of studies have shown that the benefits of diutegravir outweigh that risks, but that you want to let them know about that and have them ask any questions they might have to be able to provide more information. So I don't think it needs to be, you know, a, a, you know, a 10 minute diatribe on neural tube defects, but I think as part of counseling on potential side effects, that's one of the potential side effects. Well noted, Lynn. Um, one other question uh, coming in from Chewe. From the study that you reported um, from Cape Town regarding uptake of, of PrEP, are we seeing more and better uptake of PrEP and retention when it's offered in the postpartum period? This is again PrEP for women during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Do you feel like the uptake and retention is better postpartum than antepartum? Um, uh, my impression from the Cape Town study was that they enrolled women who were in ANC um, so that, that most of their data is coming from retention during pregnancy. I, I don't recall seeing anything suggesting that retention and adherence was better postpartum than it was uh, antepartum. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, and I, I'm not seeing any additional questions uh, coming into the Q&A or the chat box. Oh, Rike notes that there were some initial questions from Jill Gay. So um, I'm going back to the top of the chat box. Uh, Rike, would you mind? Um... I, I can see it, Shafiq, but I can't ah. answer it. The, the question was, what percent of adolescents 10 to 14 present with viral suppression and adolescents 10 to 19. And I'm not sure exactly which study she's referring to. Um, and I can't really answer that question. I think it varies between settings and countries, but that both 10 to 14 and 10 to 19 uh, uh, tend to have viral suppression rates lower than older individuals. And the other question was, given PEPFAR investments, why are there so many missed opportunities in reducing perinatal transmission? And my answer is, good question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, on that note, uh, we've come to the end of our time. So uh, permit me to thank you again, Lynn, and I'm gonna hand back to Rike uh, to close out the webinar.
Thank you very much, Shafiq. Uh, this was a really interesting discussion. And unfortunately, we are out of time. We'll have to conclude the Q&A and the discussions for now. But if there are any other questions, please send me an email and we'll get back to you. Uh, my email should be on the screen right now. And as mentioned in the beginning, we will post a PowerPoint and the recording of the webinar on the childrenaids.org website tomorrow. And there will also be a longer slide deck with additional important studies that unfortunately we did not have time to cover today. So once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Lynn Mofinson for the excellent webinar and attention um, goes to the questions asked by all of you, as well as a big thanks to Shafiq for his excellent moderation. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us today and see you hopefully on the next webinar. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye.